Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Gnosis is the root wisdom of all the world's great religions. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of many, available by free download or podcast. The hundreds of hours of lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an online chat, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate or tune into our continuous web broadcast, visit our website for more information at GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. For more information or to make a donation, visit our website at GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Of all of the great <clears throat> mythologies and traditions that we've inherited from our forefathers, one of the richest and deepest and most profound are the mysteries of the Greeks. The Greek mythologies that we learn about as we are educated in the Western world come from a very ancient tradition that unfortunately has not been transmitted through our textbooks and storybooks. What has been transmitted to us are the garments or the outer covering of these ancient stories. But the garments don't reveal the soul of those mysteries. The Greek mythology, the Greek classics, all of the gods and titans and heroes of that tradition are not just comic book stories or fairy tales. They are a profound reflection of the most ancient and venerable sciences of this, this universe. So when we recall the stories of Odysseus or Perseus or Heracles, when we remember Jason or Athena or Medusa, we have to purge from our mind the comic book interpretations of these stories and delve instead into their true heart, their true meaning. This becomes complicated for us because we've grown up with certain assumptions about mythology and history and stories. And we've been saturated in this culture with thousands of years of supposition, theory, um, different concepts, different interpretations of these stories that are not informed by the true esoteric tradition. So we have a great disadvantage. It's much the same as our traditional religions that we've grown up with 
where we grow up hearing the Sunday school interpretations of the Bible or the very superficial interpretations of all the scriptures. Those Sunday school interpretations are only the superficial literal meaning, and they don't convey the true meaning that's hidden inside the stories. I give you this preface because in today's lecture we will examine a myth that most people have heard of and most people have heard interpretations of, but firstly, the story is always told the wrong way, and secondly, the interpretation is always wrong. So it's good to remember that these stories were originated by an esoteric tradition, by a form of teaching that was not public. And so now, after thousands of years of hearing scholars and intellectuals debate and compare their theories and suppositions, we have no real idea that these stories actually have a true meaning, that the meanings are not just theoretical. They aren't just different people's concepts locked in debate with each other. These myths have a true meaning. In the same way that we ascribe meanings to different things based on our interpretation of them, those interpretive meanings don't always correspond to the true meaning, the true value or the true mystery hidden inside the, the symbol. In the ancient Greek mythology, it's related through a variety of sources that Prometheus was given the task of creating man. Prometheus is represented as a titan, a god, who was given this task by Zeus, the father of the gods, whose other name is Jupiter, or Eopatar. Prometheus was given the task to create man from clay. Now, if we were just remembering our comic book interpretations, we would think that Prometheus was a god in a body who went and picked up some clay from the ground and started sculpting a man out of it. But that is just Sunday school stuff. It's symbolic. It doesn't relate to the true meaning of the story. Prometheus as a word, of course, comes from Greek. And the meaning of Prometheus is he who sees before. He who sees before. In other words, Prometheus relates to foreknowledge. to know the future, to see something in advance of it happening. This is a kind of intelligence or a kind of force that is beyond what we know of as intelligence. It is a kind of wisdom or insight into existence. And obviously, if we've come from a tradition that is based on the Bible, then we would immediately see that Prometheus relates directly with the beginning chapters of Genesis, when the Elohim formed Adam from Aretz, the earth, the dust, the clay. And obviously, this is a correct relationship. Prometheus represents that exact force, the Elohim, Jehovah Elohim the force of creativity that is expressed through the supernal logos, through the upper triangle on the tree of life. Prometheus represents the ray of creation, the light of Christ, that organizes and forms the man. Of course, that man is not a physical body. And this is, again, where people fall into misinterpretations. 
And they assume that this story of Prometheus is just about how the physical body was originated. Scholars and teachers and professors all assume that this story of Prometheus was concocted or invented by primitive people who were seeking to merely explain the mysteries of being alive. But these scholars ignore that the ancient Greeks were not at that level of being. These stories come from an ancient secret knowledge. And the originators of these stories hid the esoteric tradition in these symbols. Prometheus is known in every religious tradition, but with different names. The Greeks did not invent Prometheus. The Greeks did not invent the symbol of man being created from clay or from the earth. You can find that symbol in every great religion. So Prometheus was given the task of creating the man. And here we have a graphic that shows Prometheus performing his task. So upon creating the man, the gods began to divvy up the portion for man, the purpose, the future, the gifts that man would need in order to grow. But Prometheus went beyond because he wanted the best for his creation. And he, through a series of different types of symbolic stories and events, you could say he tricked the gods, or he went beyond what was originally intended for man. And provided for men the best of the sacrifices. Whereas the gods were supposed to get the meat of the sacrifices, the gods got the bones, and man got the meat. And this symbolic story represents the descent of forces in nature, and how the forces and energies of evolution are focused on developing the real man. In other words, the spirit. And this development is dependent upon the good graces or the intention of Prometheus, Christ, in other words. The story is represented in different ways in different mythologies and different writers, different uh, presentations of the myth. But the end result is that man is left without the means of life. This cryptic phrase is written in um, writings of Hesiod, who is a Greek writer. Man was not given the means of life. Firstly, it means that man was not a sexual creature yet. Man was androgynous, not yet fully formed. This also relates to the early stages of Genesis, when we see that the Elohim created Adam in their image, male, female, androgynous. Man was man, woman, male, female, a single creature, not yet divided, not yet fully formed. In other words, man could not reproduce and grow and separate the sexes in the way that we know now. There was additional work that had to be done. In order to facilitate that, Prometheus steals fire from the gods. You see, the gods withheld two things from man at this stage. The means of life and fire. But Prometheus, in his longing to push the development of, of the man, steals from heaven the sacred fire. And he steals it by keeping it inside of a stalk of fennel, which is a type of plant. A stalk of fennel 
or in other words, a reed, a tube, a plant. Naturally, if you've studied these teachings, you would immediately know that this is the spinal column through which the fires of the Holy Spirit illuminate the man and begin the process of creation. That spinal column is throughout the book of Genesis. It is the letter Vav, which begins every letter, every sentence, rather, of those first four chapters of Genesis. And God said, and God said, and God did this, and God did that. That and is a Vav. That Vav is the spinal column. That spinal column is the center of the tree of life, the Kabbalah, the central column on the tree, through which those forces descend. In other words, Prometheus is the fire of Christ that descends through the Vav, through the fennel stalk, in order to deliver the fire of heaven into the man, to give us power, to give us knowledge. This story of Prometheus represents how those forces, the divine forces, can descend through us, into us, and give us the powers of creation, knowledge. We've probably all heard the story of Prometheus giving fire to man. And because of that, <clears throat> man gained all of the arts, all of his skills, all of his abilities to create, the ability to cook the ability to heat, smithing, pottery, cooking, all the different types of crafts and arts needed in order to have life, to have survival. But that's all superficial. It's just the literal garment that covers the soul, the real meaning of the story. What that fire provides, what Prometheus truly is, is the very force of life itself. Prometheus is the fire of existence. Prometheus is Christ, or in Latin, Lucifer. The Latin phrase Lucifer means bearer of light, or bearer of fire. Lucy, fair, carrier of light. That is Prometheus, the one who sees before. Prometheus Lucifer is not outside of us. Again, this is the place where these storybook ideas cloud our judgment and our ability to see the meaning. We tend to think of Lucifer as a guy in a red suit with a pitchfork who's running around somewhere doing bad things. This is not the case. This is a, another misinterpretation of the teaching that's been propagated for centuries. The real meaning of Lucifer is the bearer of light. In the book of Enoch and in the other Judeo-Christian scriptures, Lucifer is shown for what he truly is. The greatest angel. The first angel. The first in the hierarchy. The greatest one is Lucifer. The most resplendent, the most beautiful. But again, that angel is not outside of us. That angel is inside of us. Prometheus Lucifer is inside of you. Prometheus Lucifer is the fire in every atom that makes up who you are. It is the fire of life. Prometheus Lucifer is the fire of intelligence, of life, of living, of creating, of being. And the goal of Prometheus Lucifer is to create the man. Not the physical man, not a physical body, but manas, mind, man. Manas is Sanskrit. It relates to our mind, to our spirit, to intelligence. The man that Prometheus is creating is the primordial Adam, Adam Kadmon, the being. That Adam is the tree of life itself. If we look at the tree of life, we see Adam, the body of the cosmic man. That is our being. 
And the fire that descends through that tree that gives it life and existence is Lucifer, Prometheus. But you see, that cosmic man, that Adam Kadmon, is not our physical body. It is not our vital body, our astral body, our mental body. It is all of them united and made one. That equals enlightenment, liberation, self-realization, the complete human being, the perfect being. None of us are that. We are still a man in formation, a mind in development, imperfect, without that flame filled with cognizance of itself. So Prometheus is not done with us. We're still in the process of trying to be formed, trying to be made. Nonetheless, because of karma, because of cause and effect from our past actions, things get really complicated in the story now. And this is partly why, if you've learned anything about the myth of Prometheus, there are so many variations. There are so many ways of presenting the story and discussing the story, and so many interpretations. It's much like if we look at the American flag, for example, we all have an impression or a meaning that that flag inspires in us based on our experiences. But that flag has a very different meaning to people in other countries. A very different meaning. Totally different interpretation. And that flag had a very different meaning 100 years ago or 200 years ago. In the same way, Prometheus is a symbol, like a flag, who represents many different teachings depending on how we are related to it. So the aspect of the teaching that we'll be discussing today is related with us personally, not just in history. The story of Prometheus, just like the Bible, has many levels of meaning. Just as we discover in the Bible that the creation of Adam and then the formation of Eve relates to our ancient past, likewise, Prometheus and the creation of man relates with our ancient past. But we're more interested in what's happening with us right now and how to make a better future. So in the context of discussing Prometheus, we're going to focus on how to interpret the myth and understand the story relative to that, relative to us now. So if I don't address a particular aspect of the myth, it's because I'm focusing on us. When Prometheus stole the fire from heaven in order to create the man, the gods became angered in the myth Zeus was upset and needed to punish Prometheus for this. To us, as a comic book story or as a Sunday school story, this sounds crazy that the gods get mad at each other and punish each other. But we have to understand that this is not a comic book. The myth of Prometheus relates to very, very elevated levels of existence within us that deal with subtle forces of nature about which we are completely ignorant. And to illuminate that, we need to understand, firstly, that Zeus, related to Jupiter, the father of the gods, relates with Keter, relates with the Dharmakaya, the body of the law. He represents the cosmic law, balance, harmony, equanimity in all things. We are out of balance with nature. In us, when Lucifer, our own inner Prometheus, is seeking to create the man, he does so by bringing the fire from heaven to institute that creation. But we are not free from karma, from our past actions. And this is why Zeus, as representative of the law, says, okay, you took the fire, but you have to pay because of your past actions. You aren't an innocent babe 
coming into existence. You've existed before. You've created karma. You've made mistakes. And this is emphasized in the punishment symbolized in the story. This punishment takes on several forms. The first is that in order to punish Prometheus, we've all heard the story that Zeus commands that Prometheus be chained to a rock at the top of a mountain. And that an eagle or a vulture is there every day to eat his liver while he's chained there, which is a great agony. That chain is the karma. That eagle is the forces of the Holy Spirit. Forces of God, related to bina, to creation, to dat. Eating the liver, which is related with karma, and with the organs in our body that purify the blood through purification, related with sexuality, of course. That symbol is very deep and could be a whole series of lectures just on that. But before that punishment is instituted, Zeus commands that the woman be created. Now, in some stories, if you read Hesiod or some of the other writers, they present this as the woman is a punishment for humankind, for mankind. But that's only, as I was saying, relative to a certain aspect of the meaning of the story. Unfortunately, people have only heard that this woman was evil. Her name is Pandora. And we've all heard the story of Pandora opening the box or the vase, and from that vase or box escapes all the evils that plague mankind. This story has been grossly misinterpreted. In the same way that we've always misinterpreted the story of Eve. You see, Pandora is Eve. We've all grown up, if we've grown up in a Jewish or a Christian household, blaming Eve. Right? Everyone says, Eve is the cause of the fall of mankind. Because Eve ate the fruit. She listened to the serpent. And so naturally, we with our comic book minds blame women. And we've had centuries of this of women being blamed and women being punished and considered less than men because of this misinterpretation. But it's all a lie. Eve, Pandora, does not represent a physical woman. Eve, Pandora, does not represent a physical woman. Eve, Pandora, is a symbol of something much more profound. In the stories, I'll read you a little quote. This is very beautifully written by Hesiod. <clears throat> so Zeus commanded Hephaestus to make haste and mix earth with water and to put in it the voice and strength of humankind and fashion a sweet, lovely, maiden shape like to the immortal goddesses in face. Hephaestus is Vulcan, the one who works in the forge. And Vulcan, Hephaestus, creates a woman by combining the earth with the water. These are very deep alchemical symbols. And this woman is made with all of the greatest qualities of the gods. So Hesiod goes on to say, And Athena to teach her needlework and weaving, and golden Aphrodite to shed grace upon her head, and cruel longing and cares that weary the limbs. And he charged Hermes the guide, the slayer of Argus, to put in her a shameless mind and a deceitful nature, so he ordered. So Hesiod here is addressing an aspect of this story, that relates with our psychology. But this is not the only presentation of the story. Because elsewhere, we find that Pandora is described 
as receiving all the boons and benefits of the gods, but nothing deceitful, nothing negative. In fact, her very name means all gifts or all giving. Pandora. Pan is all. Dora is gift. What that means is that when Hephaestus formed this woman from the earth and the water, all of the gods came, Aphrodite, Hermes, everyone, to, came to give her their greatest gifts, beauty, intelligence, wisdom, a beautiful voice, a beautiful appearance, intelligence, all of these qualities. And when the gods beheld her, they were amazed because she was the most beautiful creation yet, just like Eve. And then she was given to the brother of Prometheus as a wife. Now let's not fall back into the comic book interpretations. Let's remember what we're talking about here. Our subtle spiritual principles deep within our being. Prometheus is Lucifer, Christ. Who is his brother? Remember when Lucifer descends into nature. In us, Lucifer inverts because of karma. Remember, Prometheus is chained to the rock, bound by karma. He becomes Satan. Not out of his will, but because of the karma. You see, that ray of creation is one all the way down the tree of life. But when it passes through the sphere of Malkut, that ray inverts. So therefore, we see at Malkut a great juncture. Malkut is related with the physical world, our physical body, us. Above it, we have the heavenly realms, and below it, we have the hell realms. But the light of creation that illuminates all of it is the same light. It's the same ray, but polarized. In the upper worlds, it is Lucifer, Christ. In the infernal worlds, it is Lucifer, Satan. Same light, but conditioned. So... The light below is Prometheus chained to the rock. That rock is Yasod. Sex. Patar. Patar is part of the name of Jupiter. Zeus. Io Patar. Patar means rock. Jupiter is that force conditioned, trapped, encaged here in relation with Prometheus in Klipot. When the woman is created Pandora... When she is merging from the earth, she comes out of the earth, right? This is an illustration of Pandora emerging from the earth, out of the clay, out of the, the earth and the water. This relates with, what is the earth? The body. Aretz. Adam is formed out of the dust of the earth. Pandora, Eve, is formed out of the dust of the earth. But the difference is that Pandora is created with the waters of sexuality. Moreover, she receives all of the beauty of the gods in her. All of those archetypes. Seems complicated, right? It is. This myth is very deep. Pandora has many levels of meaning. I'm trying to present it to you in an organized way, but the story is not organized. It's very deep. It's very intuitive. It's hard to put it in an intellectual form that makes sense. When Pandora is created, all of the gifts of the gods are given to her. She has all of the perfections. And Zeus gives her his gift, a vase, an urn. And here we have an image of a traditional... Grecian urn. They're called pithoi. Now, as an incidental note, when this story was translated some centuries ago by Erasmus, he made a mistake. He mistakenly translated the word vase as the word box. And this is why we always hear about Pandora's box. There's no box. 
It's a vase. It's important. There's a difference here. Pandora is given a vase by Zeus. And let's look at the shape of this vase. And then listen to a story that's even older than the story from Hesiod. In the Iliad, Homer wrote this. This little short passage from the Iliad will reveal the entire meaning of this story to you, if you listen carefully. So in the Iliad, Homer wrote this. There are two urns, vases, that stand on the door sill of Zeus. They are unlike for the gifts they bestow, an urn of evils, an urn of blessings. If Zeus, who delights in thunder, mingles these and bestows them on man, he shifts and moves now in evil, again in good fortune. But when Zeus bestows from the urn of sorrows, he makes a failure of man, and the evil hunger drives him over the shining earth, and he wanders respected neither of gods nor mortals. Did you get it? You remember the Garden of Eden? At the tree of knowledge of good and evil. These two urns represent Da'at, the tree of knowledge, which is hidden in the tree of life. The tree of knowledge and the tree of life are really one with two aspects. So Homer is explaining here the core secret of this mystery. Zeus gives an urn to Pandora as his gift. That urn is both of these urns. It is the tree of knowledge. It is the secret doctrine hidden in the tree of life. That urn has the potential to give good or bad. It has the potential, depending on how it's used, to result in benefit for mankind or destruction for mankind. That urn is in us. That urn is Da'at, the tree of knowledge, in us. Let's examine what that means. To firstly understand what that means, we need to see a little bit more about Pandora. Remember, Pandora is not a physical person. Pandora represents an archetype who receives all of the archetypes of all the gods. Pandora is created by Hephaestus Vulcan. Right? So Pandora represents the unfoldment of the Divine Mother from Bina. She represents the very intelligence that carries the force of Da'at. Pandora represents our Divine Mother. She is the one who receives all the benefits of the gods above. She is the archetype. She is the one who gives life. She is Eve, Hava, as a primordial archetype. And this is why, in all the ancient myths, Pandora is related with Demeter, or Gaia. And this is why all the scholars are so confused about Pandora, and they can't figure her out. They all think Pandora is a woman, physical woman. She's not. She is an archetype who has levels of meaning, but the first and most important is she is our inner individual divine mother who has in her hands the secret knowledge, Da'at. And this is why in all of the traditions around the world, the one who teaches the soul to enter the secret knowledge is the Divine Mother. Always. She's the one who teaches the path to the initiates. She is Athena. She is Minerva. She is Hera. She is Sarasvati. She is Tara. She is the Daikini. She is Mary. Maia. She's all those goddesses. Isis. Who has her secret rituals, her secret knowledge that she bestows on those who are worthy to receive it. This is Pandora in her superior aspect. Pandora is in us. She is the archetype that will result in the creation of the full establishment of the man. 
just as a little hint as to what, to what is to come, Pandora later has a child who is the firstborn mortal woman. We're going to talk about that later. Pandora is the archetype of the first woman. And who is the archetype of the woman? The goddess, the divine mother. In uh, Aristophanes, another Greek writer or poet, wrote a play called The Birds, in which he, he discussed a cult to Pandora, the earth, because she bestows all things necessary for life. What I'm trying to emphasize is that we need to discard this foolish notion that Pandora was a mortal woman who unleashed all the evils on the world. This is a wrong interpretation. Pandora is our divine mother. Now there's a lot more to it than just that. Pandora was given as a gift to the brother of Prometheus. Prometheus's brother is named Epimetheus. So the name is almost identical, except that little prefix at the beginning. So I told you Prometheus means he who sees before. Epimetheus means he who sees after. So what we're seeing here is with the gift, with Pandora receiving Dat and being given to the brother of Prometheus, we see the unfolding of the entire tree of life. He who sees before is above in the heavens. He who sees after is below in hell. Epimetheus represents Lucifer, Satan. Epimetheus also represents Adam, the fool. Epimetheus takes Pandora as his spouse. And Prometheus tells him before that, don't accept any gifts from Zeus. But Epimetheus only sees things after he's done it. That's the meaning of his name. So Zeus comes and says, here, I have a present for you, Pandora. And Epimetheus says, wow, she's beautiful. Thanks. And then later says, oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> right? So that's the comic book story. But the meaning is very deep. Epimetheus and Prometheus are the same one. Two aspects of the same thing. What happens here, though, in the story, Pandora comes to live with Epimetheus, with her vase. And we've all heard this, the famous story that she's told not to look in the vase. Don't look in there. And people have always said, well, you know, women are just too curious. They have to know what's in there. They can't leave it alone. Now, the vase is sealed, right? It has a seal on it. But she can't restrain her curiosity and wants to know what's in it. So the myth, so all these famous stories go. And she goes and peeks, and when she looks, all of the evil spirits that were trapped inside of it come out. This is the famous story that we've all heard. Unfortunately, it's not true. That's only one representation of the story among many. And it actually is not congruent with the full mystery. How would Pandora, your divine mother, do that? She would not. This is why when we study other Greek writers, we find other hints that reveal the true nature of this story and how to understand the story in its true meaning. One other ancient writer said that it was the man who opened the jar. It was the man who looked. And other ancient writers, for example, Aesop, who we've all heard about, said that when the jar was opened, what Zeus had given her were all of the good qualities of the gods. All of those virtues. And when the vase was opened, all of those virtues fled back to heaven because they don't belong on earth. And that's why mankind is without virtue. Right? So we can find different meanings that we can sort of understand here based on this. But none of them address what's really being conveyed in this teaching. 
To understand the real meaning, we have to understand the vase, what it actually means. And we have to understand that Pandora has levels of meaning. The vase that Pandora receives, as I mentioned, is twofold. It is a duality, like everything. The tree of life itself is a duality, and all the forces in nature are dual, having a polarized potential, positive or negative. And on that scale, there is a great deal of range or relative levels, either above or below. This urn represents that potential. The urn is a gift from Zeus. It is all of the archetypes of all the gods put into our Divine Mother, given to her and brought to us in our soul. We abuse and break the seal on that urn when we don't respect the law. Remember Zeus said, don't look in it. It's the same command as given in the Garden of Eden. Do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, for if you do, you will surely die. It is the same symbol. And what is that tree of knowledge? It is not merely the tree of knowledge. It is not merely etz vadat. It is etz vadat ha ve tob ve ra. The tree of knowledge of goodness and pollution. Just the same as Homer said, there are two urns at the doorway of Zeus. Right? Two urns. One with goodness, one with pollution or evil. Those urns are really one. That urn is in us. Where? That urn has levels of, of meaning here. Very subtle. I know we all like to fix one definition on it and say it's that. It's not that simple. The urn is also an archetype. Primarily, it represents Da'at, the tree of knowledge. But that power, that knowledge, is in many levels and has many implications. As an example, Pandora represents our Divine Mother, who holds the urn. But Pandora also represents our mind. Because our mind is a reflection of the Divine. Our mind is a child of the Divine Mother. Our mind is feminine. Our mind is Eve, and within us is Adam and Eve, right? Two aspects of mind. Pandora is also related with our sexual organs. Adam, the primordial man, is related with our brain and nervous system, with our spinal column, with the fennel stalk. Remember, the fennel stalk comes first with the fire inside, then Pandora. Adam the brain, the nervous system. Pandora is sex. So there are many levels here. But what's most beautiful is if you compare this urn, the vase, with Eve. If you observe the shape of the urn, you will see the shape of a uterus. That is no mistake. If you imagine the shape of the urn, and place it over the sexual organs of the woman, you see the uterus, the sexual organs. That urn, the sexual organs, is where the hidden mystery of dot, the tree of knowledge, is. There, in sex. That is the ancient mystery. But because of cupidity, in other words, curiosity and ignorance, we always want to know what is inside of that urn? We're always longing to taste, to experience something hidden in sex that our conscience tells us we know we shouldn't approach. Our conscience tells us don't go there, but we never listen because of desire. And so we go into sex seeking to know what is inside of the urn. And because of that cupidity, that foolishness, we break the seal. What is that seal on the urn? It is a hymen. It is virginity. It is chastity. 
You see, when you place a seal on the urn, when that urn is first delivered, it is chaste, it is pure, it is unbroken. It is knowledge, it is da'at, but pure. But when in our ignorance, in our curiosity, in our foolishness, we penetrate into that, we look inside of that urn, we defile it. That's how these forces of Prometheus invert and become Epimetheus, Satan, who's chained to the rock, sex. This is the mystery that's hidden here in Pandora's vase. It relates to events from the past, but it relates to events now. What we need to learn is to restore the purity of that vessel. We have to learn how to free Prometheus from the rock. When we study the mythology, we see that Prometheus is chained to the rock. And this bird eats his liver as a punishment. And Prometheus suffers the unbearable. But why? Because he was seeking to better his creation. And bears upon himself the karma of his creation. This is a sacrifice. Exactly the same as the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. It is the force of Christ sacrificing itself for the betterment of man. Our inner Prometheus is at this moment crucified on that rock. Suffering. That inner Prometheus is our very intelligence, our ability to create, which is chained to the rock of bitterness, karma, suffering, this world. And has been there for ages, suffering on our behalf because of his efforts to give us the fire that creates life. The way to free Prometheus is to create Heracles. That is a huge story. The arrival of Heracles, who eventually is able to come up to the top of the mountain and free Prometheus. Heracles is the son of Hera, the Divine Mother. Heracles is our human soul, but filled with the fire of Christ. Heracles is a bodhisattva, a true initiate. This is how we free our inner Prometheus. It's not an easy task. It isn't accomplished through beliefs or through dogma or through debate. In order to restore Pandora's vase, we have to restore its seal. That seal is chastity. Not just chastity physically, chastity psychologically. And this is the key factor. While we do relate this vessel, the vase, with the sexual organs, we're not discussing merely the physical organs. We're talking about sexuality in all the levels of the mind. You see, the gift of that, the mysteries of sex, is a gift that the Divine Mother has. It is her very nature. It is her very essence. Sexuality is how creation is performed on every level of nature, without exception. When we observe a nebula in, in the sky, a nebula is a birthplace of suns. A nebula is the very energy of Lucifer Prometheus, who's working to create a sun. And that creation is sexual, but at that level. Not with human organisms, but with different organisms on a much different scale. Nonetheless, that activity is sexual. It is the combination of polarities, male, female, in chastity, in purity, that allows Lucifer to create suns, to create universes. That same creation is what needs to occur in us in order for the real man to be fully formed. And the story of that creation comes in the later myths, with the stories of Deucalion, with Heracles, with Theseus and Perseus, and many other stories. Prometheus and Pandora 
set the stage in the same way that the creation of Adam and Eve set the stage. But let's make no mistake. The beginning of the creation of the real man is sexual. Not just physically, psychologically. This means while we may establish chastity physically, learning to restrain and harness the fire that Prometheus gives us, physically is only one aspect. You see, that fire of Prometheus, Lucifer, Christ, descends from above into us through the fennel stalk, our spine, and descends into Pandora, the vase, our sexual organs in us, which is where the archetype of the Divine Mother is waiting. And that archetype in Hinduism is called Kundalini, Shakti, the Divine Mother. That is Kundalini, Pandora who's waiting for that archetype to be elaborated. She's waiting to have her daughter. Pandora has a daughter. Her name is Pyrrha. Pyrrha is Greek for fire. You see, this isn't a comic book story. It's initiatic. The daughter of Pandora is fire. The Divine Mother Kundalini. The fire of the Pentecost that emerges from its enclosed vessel, the chakra muladhara, which is, again, the vase of Pandora. That vase is blackened. It is impure. But when the fire, through chastity, awakens there, it begins to purify all of those negative elements. And that purification is represented in many stories that we've been discussing. How we conquer the Minotaur, how we conquer Medusa, and all of those stories represent the same thing. Through chastity, the retention of that fire, we keep the fire in the fennel stalk. You see, Prometheus is using the fennel stalk to light the fire in the heart of the man. That fire has to raise from the sexual organs up through the heart. This is the great secret. It's not just a physical thing. It's emotional. It's intelligent. It's psychological. The raising of that fire is what begins to restore the purity of our inner Pandora. And it begins to set the stage so that Heracles can rise and free Prometheus from his chains. But that's a long process. If you want to know more about Heracles and the many labors he has to perform, you can read the book, The Three Mountains, which explains in detail as much as can be explained about that process. It's a long story. But in the end, Prometheus, Lucifer, is redeemed. It's the same story as Dante descending into the inferno. If you recall, Dante goes deep down into all the levels of the inferno. And what does he find in the very center in the ninth sphere? Prometheus. Lucifer. Frozen. He's frozen because there's no fire there. He's crystallized in karma. Shedding tears of ice. And those same tears are the tears of him being crucified at the stone chained to the rock with the eagle eating his liver. The tears of Lucifer crying for pain because of his beloved child, which is us. This is not just a pretty story or an interesting concept. This is a palpitating reality in your heart, in your soul. Lucifer is not a theory. Prometheus is not just a myth. Prometheus is inside of you. In the same way your Divine Mother is inside of you. This path is all about rectifying this mistake. Learning to purify the mind in order to free Prometheus and fulfill his purpose, which is to create the man. 
That process needs him. That process cannot be accomplished without Lucifer. It's impossible. Lucifer is the one who creates the man. Prometheus. In other words, when we start to work with these mysteries of God, we're working with the mysteries of Lucifer, with Prometheus. And we're working with the mysteries of the Divine Mother, Pandora. And this is precisely why it's such a challenge. In the first place, we have to understand what these mysteries are, which is challenging enough. In the second place, we have to start seeing the reality of it in our mind. We have to start seeing our true problems, our psychological problems, which are rooted in sexual problems. That's hard too. But even harder is to change them. What's beautiful, though, is that through that path, both Prometheus and Pandora help us. You see, Pandora is the one from whom all life emerges. She is the Divine Mother. She is the mother of the living. We want to become one of the living. Not physically living, spiritually living. And the one who allows that to happen is our Divine Mother, who's inside of us, who unfortunately needs fire to do it, and she has no fire now. When we institute this work practically in ourselves, entering into chastity, restraining that fire, and working with that fire, we begin to give the energy to Pandora Prometheus in us. It institutes a great dramatic change. Not easy. Basically, when we do that, our whole ego reacts in different ways depending on our idiosyncrasy. We face enormous resistance. Our mind starts to fight against it. This teaching is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong because of this reason and that reason. It works through our three brains in order to convince us to leave. And in fact, the thing that's hard to grasp here is that the one who's doing it is Lucifer, Prometheus. You see, Prometheus, while he is chained to the rock and suffering on our behalf, he's also the one who trains us to free him. He's the tempter, the trickster. In the same way that Prometheus tricks the gods to steal the fire, he is Loke. He is the one who is very clever and no one can figure him out. He's our psychological trainer. He's inside of us. And when we take this work seriously, he starts to organize what in us needs to be worked on. He takes that fire and uses it to begin to free us. But the only way he can do that is to show us the cage. We don't like to see the cage. We want to stay in the cage. What this means in practical terms is that when we begin to harness that fire physically and psychologically through chastity and transmutation, he begins to use that fire in order to show us ourselves. We start to face tests, ordeals, difficulties, resistance, problems, all of them in the mind. We always, again, come with the storybook thing, thinking that initiation is a great, beautiful story that happens in our life, and that everyone will admire us for it. Not the case. Initiation is inside. It's in your heart. It's in your mind. And outside, nobody can tell. In fact, you might find that outside people like you less. You may have problems, difficulties. People may reject you. Not even for this work, but for other reasons. You will find your life becomes hard, painful, difficult. And so your mind naturally starts to say, 
this work is no good. This work is only making my life worse. It's the same comment that we hear when people begin to learn how to meditate. They start to practice and observe their mind, and they feel like their mind is getting worse. Their mind is getting more out of control. And it's not true. It just happens that they're starting to see the actual state of their mind. Likewise, when we take this work seriously, we start to see the actual state of our life, the actual state of our mind. It's very weak and very easy to manipulate. We don't have much will. But you see, this is another mystery hidden in Prometheus. Prometheus is the one who sees before. Really, you can say Prometheus is willpower. Prometheus even has the will to go against the gods because he steals the fire. We need to steal the fire. We need that will, but to steal the fire from the devil. That devil is our own mind. To do that, we need will. We need the will of Prometheus. So it sounds contradictory. It sounds like we're pitting... Prometheus against himself, and we are, but inside of ourselves, psychologically. This is the great challenge, and this is what's represented in Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's very difficult. It takes a lot of willpower, and you feel like you're going to die. And the fact is, you will, and you need to. Everything in you that is impure, that escaped out of that vase due to its abuse, has to die. Only when all those impurities die can the true beauty emerge. All of those impurities in us have to be destroyed and killed. And that is the Divine Mother's job. You see, Prometheus organizes this work. He brings the fire and he says, look at yourself. He brings you the tests. He brings you the ordeals. He brings you the problems. He brings you to face yourself. All he really does is show you a mirror. This is you. I know you don't like it, but this is you. That's what he says. But then, if we face that, if we look squarely at ourselves and we work to change those impure elements in ourselves, then Pandora can step in, the Divine Mother, and take that fire and destroy that impurity. This is why she is the mother of the living, the one who gives everything, the giver of gifts. Properly translated, her name, Pandora, means all giving. She is not the origin of evil. She is the origin of good. But, if we misuse the reflection of Pandora in ourselves, if we abuse of that vase in ourselves, she inverts, just like Lucifer does, just like Prometheus does. She also polarizes negatively, becomes trapped. Do you have any questions? question is, is Mephistopheles from the story of Faust the same as Lucifer? Yes. Mephistopheles is the same figure. And when he warns Faust about the woman, it's the same warning. It's the same warning of saying, do not eat from the tree of knowledge. It's the same warning of, do not accept a gift from Zeus. It's the same warning of, do not look into the vase. But we're always too curious. Let me make a comment about the story of Hesiod, because this has also been really misinterpreted for a long time. Hesiod, in his book, um, Works and Days, and his Theogony, presented Gnosis very clearly. Hesiod was a Gnostic, even if people don't call him by that term. By our definition, 
A Gnostic is someone who works consciously in initiation and who knows this knowledge from the hidden tradition. And Hesiod belonged to that tradition. But like all the other initiates through the Piscean era, he wrote and represented that teaching symbolically. He didn't write it literally. Moses didn't write it literally. The apostles of Jesus didn't write it literally. Neither did Hesiod. The story that he relates about Pandora, he describes Pandora as being the greatest guile or subterfuge that the gods performed against mankind. So he says, Pandora was created as the most beautiful, resplendent woman, but with a devilish, cunning mind. And he goes on to write that woman is the curse of humanity. And so people for centuries now, for 2,500 years, have read this and read it as an attack against women physically and a condemnation against women as a sex physically. But this is wrong. This is not the right interpretation. That book is a scripture. It is not literal. What Hesiod is writing about is the mind, is the sexual organs, is our own inner Pandora. Our inner Pandora is a curse on us when that Pandora is inverted, when she is corrupted with desire. And that is our case. Our mind is trapped in desire. We love our mind. We are infatuated with our mind. We think our mind is the best thing in creation. So clever, so smart, so beautiful, but a devil. Because all it is is desire. That is what Hesiod is addressing. Hesiod was presenting an initiatic mystery in the clothing of a story, written for initiates. But all these scholars got a hold of it and had been using it for thousands of years to make all kinds of claims about Greek traditions, but they're not founded on anything but supposition. Because all these scholars and intellectuals don't know the teachings. They don't know the Kabbalah. They don't know the hidden mysteries inside the story. We see the same thing in the Judeo-Christian traditions where they always condemn women because of Eve. It's a wrong interpretation. Pandora is not women physically. Pandora is an archetype. Was there another question in the back? Yeah. Yes. Do you find that there are modern day writers that create media with this, these symbolic teachings? I ask this because it seems very silly, but my husband watches a lot of comic shows and cartoons and things. And there's one in particular that, I mean, it sounds silly, that has a lot of these symbolic meanings where you have to go to a different level and level and reach inside yourself. Um, if these cartoons or books or t just anything in modern day, because all these things that we're studying are ancient, do you find if there are similarities to these teachings, is it unconscious or maybe these are people that are Gnostic and, you know, not you know, yeah, I understand advertising you. that fact or whatever? There's been a lot of talk for the last... 10 or 15 years maybe about so-called Gnostic themes in media, movies and books and TV and things like that. And of course, all the fundamentalists are claiming this is the influence of Satan. And all of the pseudo-esotericists are claiming this is the secret doctrine that's spreading through our media, you know, which is supposed to be a good thing. The reality is the vast majority of these TV shows and movies and books that are coming out that have these themes are being created by people who just get these ideas, but they don't know where they get the ideas from. They might read some books, but they get an inspiration and they make this, these stories. Where do they get them? These stories are eternal. These stories are in our blood because they are us. You see, the Greeks didn't make up Prometheus and the Jews didn't make up Lucifer or Satan. All of these things are archetypes that are inside of us. And when an artist or a creator sits to make something, whether they like it or not, or are conscious of it or not, what they make reflects what is inside. That's why when you look at any art form, you are seeing the mind of the one who made it. 
Does that make sense? You're seeing that person's consciousness. You're seeing their level of being. That's why when we look at what humanity is creating, we see a lot of very disturbing things. We see enormous violence and all kinds of crude and animalistic behaviors. We see very little virtue because that's the level of being that humanity is at now and the people making these, these creations. Furthermore, in the last 50 years, there has been a great upswing in interest in the secret teachings since the 1950s. And in the 60s, it really accelerated where everybody wanted to know about all the mysticism from the East or wanted to know about Kabbalah and go into the mysticism of the West or learn about the mysticism of the Aztecs or the Egyptians. A huge groundswell emerged, which is still advancing. And we see that in all of our media, especially TV and movies, things like that. There's a great interest in what we would call pseudo-esoteric subjects, right? Mysticism, magic, spells, ancient history, Atlantis, other planets, other worlds, fantasies, dimensions, all these science fiction, all of that stuff relates to something that's happening in nature. It's called the Dionysic wave. And it's also called the age of Aquarius. When the age of Aquarius began, we moved out of the Piscean era into this new era. And the age of Aquarius is the bringer of knowledge, but the secret knowledge, the occult knowledge. And that's why Aquarius is represented pouring out a, a vessel. It is the same vessel of Pandora. That vessel contains all the secret knowledge, the waters from which the woman, the Divine Mother, is created. That vessel is Da'at. So subconsciously, unconsciously, all of humanity is being affected by this influence, stellar influence. And that's why this interest is rising. Even in Christian churches, they're talking about meditation and Kabbalah, which 15, 20 years ago, they would have said it's from the devil. Now Christian churches, they're practicing yoga, where 15, 20 years ago, they would have said it's from the devil. They're not conscious of that change. It's an influence that's affecting the mind that people are asleep. They don't realize. But that is the coming of Aquarius. It is the coming of the knowledge. It is the age that Samael initiated. It is that knowledge that's being poured out in all the levels. And so people who are creative get inspired from that without realizing. But unfortunately, they take that influence and it's filtered through their mind. So this is why we see a lot of movies and TV shows that appear on the surface to be Gnostic, but are actually black magic. A lot of shows, movies, books, many, 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 thousands upon thousands. So this idea of Gnostic themes is a little bit of a misnomer. It's a little bit misnamed. Yeah, the themes are emerging in the subconsciousness, but they are being filtered and propagated through the inverted aspect of the mind. Make sense? Kind of scary. But it's good because it shows that we have a predisposition now, naturally, because of this help we're getting from above, to learn this knowledge. That's why it's being revealed openly. Partly because the age of Aquarius is beginning to bring in a new age, but also because the karma is such that we need to get it now to take advantage of it because time's running out. So the TV shows and movies and all that stuff, truthfully, are completely irrelevant. Some people say, but these movies inspire people to look deeper and find the teaching. I disagree. Movies and TV shows hypnotize you. And they feed you the concepts of the mind of the person who made them. What is in that person's mind? To make money. To become famous. To become recognized. To be admired. Where do you find true food for your spirit? In movies or TV? I don't think so. You'll find the true nourishment for your spirit inside through meditation, inside, through practice, in relation with others, when you're conscious with others, cognizant. That's how you nourish your spirit. 
You can take in entertainment, but be wary and transform those impressions. Don't take them at face value. Comprehend it. Take it in and compare it. Make it cognizant in you. Don't just take it in and say, oh, beautiful. Things that appear beautiful often are not. You can only judge it with your consciousness awake. Then you'll know. Another question? What's the equivalent of uh, Pandora in the uh, Egyptian? Uh, Pandora is closely related with Isis in the Egyptian tradition. Pandora, well, Isis has a very deep and rich mythology also. But Isis is also the one who holds the mysteries, right? She is the one who contains the archetypes of the gods. And she's the one who gives of herself. She's also the one who, um, through the mystery of Osiris and Horus, goes through the process of recovering the coffin. Have you ever heard the, the myth? That coffin is the same vase, the box. So if you study those two myths together, you'll see a, a huge range of similarities because they come from the same root. Was there another question? I believe they overlap in some cases because the Isaiah tradition did go into Greece and the Grecian tradition did go into Egypt also. Right. So they intermingled. The other thing to keep in mind is that there is not one Greek tradition. Greece was a collection of city-states and there were many schools at many different levels and they all interpreted the teachings according to the psychology of their group. So that's why we find a lot of diversity in the myths and the same with Isis. There's a lot of diversity because of the rise and fall of different groups at different levels. But they did overlap, as far as I understand. Ultimately, they come from the same root. Hermes. Hermes was the Egyptian initiate who, from him, flowered all of these mystery schools. Hermes Trismegistus, who in Egypt is called Toph. So they all ultimately can be traced back to him, and he was Atlantean. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. If our minds are so bad, why is it if you focus on the thought for a long time, good or bad, it helps people fulfill our desire? So, if our minds are so bad, why is it when we focus on a thought, good or bad, we can f we then fulfill that desire? Because the focus, that concentration, is conscious will. Whether it's evil will or pure will depends on the conditioning of it. And to say bad or good is also relative. We need to know in relation with what. When we talk about our mind being impure, we're not saying that, that we are evil or bad in the ultimate sense. We're saying that we are impure. Evil, good and bad are relative. Good and evil are terms that are really have made a mess of religion. They really have. What we say, rather, to be more specific is that our mind has fallen into impurity. And when we use our will to fulfill desire, we build desire. Simple. It's very evident. The more you chase a desire, the stronger it gets. The more you feed a desire, the stronger it gets. The more you indulge in impurity, the more it spreads. That's all. Conversely, the more you follow your conscience to know the difference between what is right and what is wrong, and you actually do what is right and listen to do what is right, you will propagate more rightness, more purity. But again, these are relative to the amount of will we invest into it. You see, the, the force of will is the force of Prometheus. It is that. Willpower. But how much will do we have? And where is our will? Right now, we're a very divided house. We have a lot of will trapped in desires. 
we have very little will that is free to go against desire. It's a very challenging position to be in. But we have really no choice. If we want to come out of impurity and come out of suffering, we have to grow our will that is free of desire. And that's a moment-to-moment -moment effort. It isn't once a day or once a week. It's continual effort. Is there another question? Yeah. Is it possible to equate the age of Aquarius with an archaic revival, a coming, a, a coming full circle? Is the age of Aquarius equated to an archaic revival of coming full circle? Yeah. The, every humanity passes through many phases of development. And what we see with the age of Aquarius is, of course, a revival or recapitulation of the previous age of Aquarius, which was a long, long, long time ago. And also, any time any age begins, there is always a recapitulation of past events and karmas. In the same way that when our body is created, we see in the creation of that body a recapitulation of all its previous states. So the same is happening in this age as Aquarius begins. But that beginning happens over many centuries. It doesn't happen from one minute to the next. So we talk about the beginning of the age of Aquarius happening on a certain day and time. But it doesn't mean that it was from one minute to the next that everything changed. Planets rotate according to progression. The stars move according to progression. The planets the solar systems, the universes, everything changes according to gradual progressions. For example, we talk about 2012. Everybody's worried about 2012, that something big is going to happen. Yes, something is going to happen, but not one day. 2012 marks the beginning of a change, but it isn't going to happen in one day or one year. It's going to happen over a long period of time. Will we see it? Probably. Will we like it? Probably not. <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, it is irrelevant. Truthfully, it is irrelevant. Whether there is a new cosmic era beginning now, a new golden age, or whether the destruction of humanity is approaching, it is irrelevant. Because no matter which one comes, we will still die. We will still have our karma. One way or the other, it doesn't matter. What matters is what you do with your life. Right now. Today. Tomorrow. The next day. That's what matters. If you harness the fire of Prometheus in your heart, in your mind, in your sex, and you use that fire with conscious will to change yourself, not to change other people, not to try to escape some coming event, or to prove yourself to the gods that you're worthy to go to some cosmic ship or some sacred island somewhere? No. To change yourself, because you have to do it. Then you can do it. Then you can change. If you focus that way inside, in yourself, changing every day, changing, directing all your energies and forces into changing, to become a better person, to stop being vain, proud, lustful, envious, gluttonous, and lazy. We all love to study the teachings and hear the ideas, but when it comes to practice, we're very lazy. We think once we've heard the concept, or had the lectures, or gotten a t-shirt, or a book, that we're on the path. We're not. Even if you're restraining the energy, that doesn't put you on the path. What puts you on the path is psychological change, transformation. That's what does it. And that comes through a powerful, incredible diligence, not laziness. That diligence doesn't just mean, today I'm going to meditate for an hour, tomorrow I'm going to meditate for two hours, the next day three hours. No. It's a diligence from moment to moment to be constantly observing and changing the flow of your mind. Everything that comes in, everything that goes out, you're changing with conscious will that listens to conscience. A conscious will that says, no, this element is not appropriate. This element is harmful. I cannot allow it to express itself. Or, this element is good. I need that. 
moment to moment, constantly watching this. This is a very difficult task. And one of the most overwhelming forces that we have to deal with in this battle is our own emotions. People like to talk about we're always fighting against other schools and other groups and other religions and our family and our friends and our work. Those are not the biggest obstacles. The biggest obstacles are in your mind and in your heart. It is your own negative emotions. It is your own self-cherishing that says, oh, I'm suffering too much, God. I don't have the strength to do it. Please, God, give me inspiration. I can't do it. And we're trying to manipulate God into giving us something that we want. Please, God, if you give me a new apartment, then I'll meditate more. Please, God, if you get rid of my neighbor who's so noisy, then I'll meditate more because it'll be quieter. We all do these games in the mind. Or please, God, if you give me a spouse, then I can really advance. No. God gives us exactly what we need. Whatever you have right now is exactly what you need in order to do your work. Don't look for anything else. It's pride that wants something else. It's laziness that wants something else. It's envy that wants something else. When you kill pride and you say, I'm going to humble myself at the feet of my inner God and accept what he gives me and use it to the best of my ability. That is true humility. That is true diligence. The one who says, okay, God, I didn't want this, but it's what I have. Let me use it. This is the meaning, really, of a true tantric. They always say that tantra um, takes advantage of the worst adversities and transforms them into benefits. That is a true uh, initiate of Tantra is able to do that. Can any of us do that? I don't know, because I hear from myself complaining all the time about my circumstances. And then I hear from students all the time complaining about their circumstances. Oh, I don't have this, I don't have that, I need this, I need that. But I believe we can do it. I believe any one of us can do it. If we just accept what we have, work with that, and move ahead. Was there another question in the back? So certainly, the base of Pandora is that to serve the mind and all the evil that is inside, is over here. Yeah, if you look at the, the version that Hesiod gives of the myth, that inside the vase are all the evils, and that when Pandora opens it, all the evils are released, we can equate that with the mind that Pandora relates to our mind. And to get more specific with it, we can say, as, as uh, Samael and Vior said, that Pandora's box is really the Ark of the Covenant. Pandora's vase is the Ark. And when we enter into this work, we open the Ark. And that's what I was trying to express when I was saying, when you, work, when you enter into the work and you begin to work with chastity, with Da'at, you open your ark, and all the evil comes out. And that evil is your karma. It's your ego. It's your mind. It's all of your defects. It comes out, and it afflicts you. No question. So if you think, oh, I'm trying to do this sexual alchemy and transmutation and pranayama, and my life is worse, good. It should be. Because that's where all of your evilness is being revealed to you. That's what you have to work on. It's the same symbol. It is the grail. It is the grail. It's the grail of that's in Parsifal. The same grail. Right. The same symbol in Revelation when the angel takes the key to open the, the bottomless pit. That is the vase of Pandora that contains all of our evilness, but it has to be purged. The opening of the ark or the opening of the vase releases all of these spirits into the world. And the most famous version of the myth is that all the evilness comes out. 
And as one person mentioned here, it's related with the angel who has the key to the pit, and he opens the pit, and all the evil comes out. That is what happened when the age of Aquarius was initiated. The same thing. When Samuel and Vior opened the key of Dat and opened the, the meanings of the true teaching, the karma of the world was opened. That was a seal. Have you studied the seals in Revelation? The seven seals? One of those seals is the opening of the pit. And that was what Samael and Vior did when he opened the keys to Dat. So that marked a progression towards the end of this race. When the locusts are freed, the locust is the teaching, the Kabbalah. It's when all of that information, all the knowledge becomes freed and it afflicts man. And this is one of the things that all the interpreters of Pandora's vase could never grasp. How it is that Zeus would give this gift but put evil into it. And it's because there have these many levels of meaning. It's not so simple. Many levels, all of which are true. What's important for us is to focus on what's practical and applicable to ourselves now. All of these things are true. And they all have relevance. But what's most important is that we use the teaching for what they were meant for, which is to change. The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Help Gnostic Radio to help others. Make a donation by visiting GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the wide variety of resources available on our websites. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.